funding for Firing Line is provided by this station and by other public television stations. What a friend we have all lost. And far beyond the walls of this temple or the borders of this city, there are countless human beings whom Al Lowenstein had befriended and did not even know his name. There are black people in Mississippi who can vote because he was there in the civil rights summer of 1964. There are American sons living out normal lives who did not die in Vietnam because he was there in New Hampshire in 1968 in the winter of our national discontent. There are political prisoners in the Soviet Union whose cause was heard before the world because he was there in the United Nations to demand their cases be stated and debated. He was everywhere. He was the man who lived for others. I always thought that somehow he was too good for this world. And in the end, the world he reached out to broke him because he was the last friend left of a man scorned by everyone else. But while we mourn his death, we remember most the light and joy of his life. He was a person of impassioned political conviction, but personally he loved so many who so often disagreed with his politics. Who but Al Lowenstein could claim among his best friends both Bill Buckley and Robert Kennedy? Bill Buckley had the good political sense to endorse him for Congress. And Al had the good political sense not to endorse Bill for mayor in 1960. <laughs> Al would do almost anything for Bill. <laughs> Al was a loyal friend who spoke with uncommon frankness. No man was an island as long as Al Lowenstein was near. Where blacks were repressed, he was black. When soldiers were dying in a war that was wrong, he was a draftee to his own conscience. Where children were hungry, he thirsted after justice. When families could not afford a house, he was homeless. For me, he was more than a friend, though his friendship was rare. He was more than a counselor, though his counsel was wise. For me and for so many others, he was our brother. Last Thursday, the day before he died, he was writing a speech he wanted me to give. His last words in that speech read, do we want four more years of what we have experienced to date? It was the wonder and the glory of Al Lowenstein that he never wanted more years of what we had experienced to date. Always he called us to do better. It is the last and the least that we can give to Al in return for all that he gave to us the pledge of our hearts that we shall, each in our own way, strive as he so tirelessly did to do better. Our brother left us his love. He goes with ours. You have heard the eulogy by Senator Edward Kennedy, one of six pronounced on Tuesday, March 18th, at the funeral of Allard Lowenstein who four days earlier, while working in his office in New York, was shot and killed by a former and presumably deranged Confederate. 
Albert Lowenstein's hectic life is, however, fragmentarily chronicled in his frequent appearances on Firing Line, and this hour is given over to excerpts from the nine programs on which he appeared. The first time was in the late summer of 1968, immediately after the stormy convention in Chicago that handed the Democratic nomination to Senator Humphrey. I introduced him then as follows. Uh, Mr. Al Lowenstein <clears throat> is generally regarded as the approximate agent of the whole McCarthy phenomenon. He went first to Senator Robert Kennedy, but was turned down, then to Senator McGovern Ditto, finally to Senator Eugene McCarthy, whom he persuaded to challenge Lyndon Johnson in the Democratic primaries. The rest, as they say, is history. <clears throat> and I suppose the wonder of it is that the Democratic Convention summoned the will to deny Mr. Lowenstein. Uh, it is, as others have discovered, a very difficult thing to do. At the age of <clears throat> 10, Mr. Lowenstein was weeping because the loyalists lost the war in Spain. <clears throat> he has had a great deal to weep about since then, uh, the world having developed the perplexing faculty of going every now and then in other than the direction uh, the ADA, of which Mr. Lowenstein is needless to say an official, uh, desires. But <clears throat> he has had many victories, too, since he strove at Chapel Hill as an undergraduate to integrate the student council and served fresh out of Yale Law School as president of the National Student Association. Uh, he revered and was revered by uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. Norman Thomas thinks him the hope of his generation. Uh, ditto Richard Goodwin. John Kenneth Galbraith wants him elected to Congress uh, for which he is running uh, on the grounds that uh, Mr. Galbraith says that he, quote, can't think of anyone who could possibly be such a force for liberal policy in Congress, which certainly would suggest that Mr. Lowenstein should go to Congress or that Mr. Galbraith can't think. <laughs> I should like to begin by asking uh, Mr. Lowenstein whether he approves of Senator McCarthy's refusal to back the ticket. Well, I've not backed the ticket myself, so I don't know that I would have to uh, disapprove of someone else taking the same position. But well, do you approve of your not backing it? Well, I must say that I approve of it uh, more as a principle than I have as a political tactic. I, I think that it's the right thing to do, and it's what I think those of us who feel as, as I do about the direction of the country have to do at this stage. Uh, as a candidate, it presents problems, and those problems are uh, <coughs> interesting ones to cope with. I, I suppose that uh, on balance, what I believe has to be done this year is for people uh, across the country to say what they feel is right and uh, attempt to survive doing that. I notice you're not backing the Democratic ticket either, so I suppose we share that at least at this point. I don't think it was widely suggested that I would. Uh. <laughs> Three years have gone by. Lowenstein is now a member of Congress. It's one year before Watergate. His opposition to Nixon and to the Vietnam War have intensified. I think that the way you remove President Nixon from office is you defeat him, and I'm engaged in an effort to make clear that's possible. But I've never supported impeachment of President Nixon, not because, and I, what I want to do is to get into the questions that you raised, the basic questions that you raised, and just clear away some of the underbrush. It is, in fact, untrue to say that I became a devotee of democracy, as you suggest, only when the country uh, by polls went my way. I think that the job of people who are in public office or seeking public office, I think I agree with you on this, is to say what they believe, to stand on what they believe, and if they lose, to lose. Right. And I don't think you go with polls. I never have. I hope I never do. But I think that what we said in 1968 when we opposed the renomination of President Johnson was, in fact, the majority sentiment of the country. We'll never know because in Los Angeles there was an assassination which punctured the, no the normal procedures, which would have given a test in that election. The election that fall then ended up not as a test of differences, but rather a test of which of two men uh, could persuade people that they were uh, less undesirable. At least that was the case for millions of people in the country. And what I think we have to see is that as a result of the frustrations that developed in 1968 through the murders and the other uh, horrors of that spring, is that for millions of people, there is a kind of erosion of belief in the whole ele election process. That's led to uh, some people doing extreme things in frustration, which are unconstitutional and unjustifiable. And I think we share opposition to that kind of tactic. But doesn't that mean if we're against those tactics, that those of us that are equally against the war have an obligation to continue raising that issue. Oh, sure. Right. I asked him what formal party loyalties he subscribed to, or were his loyalties those that bound people to a common cause? 
It's a very important point to make, and I think it's, it's a good time to make it. I am not supporting Pete McCloskey for any office. I didn't support him for the office he now holds, and I'm not supporting him for any now seeks. But you're being formalistic, aren't you? No, I, I'm being very precise. What do you have against him? <laughs> He's a Republican. Aha, okay. <laughs> then, you are being one. then you are being formalistic. A moment ago, you said that you well, really what, didn't no. care about party labels or party discipline or that kind of thing. You care about what people are like. Now, what do you have against him as opposed to the designation that you run under? Now, first I'll answer what I was trying to answer before you try to get me to answer something I'm not trying to answer. Then I'll answer Which you want not to time. answer. <laughs> well, I'll answer both in due course. What my feelings are, and I think you would agree with this, is that people, regardless of party labels, ought to work together on issues they agree about. Mm -hmm. We happen to agree about the war. We disagree about the draft, in which I work with you. We agree about the draft. Mm -hmm. I don't think that my agreeing with you about the draft means that I'm committed necessarily to supporting you if you run for president. If so, it would be an awful decision for me to make because I'd like to work with you. I would like to continue working with you against the draft without feeling that obliged me to yeah, support yeah, but your you're ambition. You're being very sly, Al. You're being very sly. I, because I can't keep we, we, up with we, you know, in the no, department of being sly. No, Toward the end of President Nixon's term of office, Lowenstein was thinking about reforms, his favorite subject. He wanted public financing of elections and emphasis on integrity in government. I, I, I intend to spend a lot of time, if, if you're willing to do so, yeah. on financing. But I thought before getting there, since that's so sort of bottomless, we might um, ask uh, some questions about why Congress doesn't behave more convincingly. Uh, we, the assumption is that there are in Congress unbribed people yeah. who are devoted to the public interest. Why are they so anonymous? If the only problem were the balance of powers between three branches, um, I'd be much less troubled. But it's my sense of the present difficulty. You lose your persona in that case. Right. <laughs> I like you troubled. I'll try to stay troubled. <laughs> Although there's an awful lot these days that makes one feel as if there's a lot that the rabbis used to tell me you should not engage in schadenfreude, which is the process of enjoying the suffering of others. I must say that every time I think of the latest involvement of the White House, uh, when I think of... You're tempted. Uh, I'm tempted. <laughs> There's something about the people who have most preached at you, uh, engaged in the process of redemptive suffering themselves, that makes one feel it's perhaps less wicked to enjoy that than if they hadn't previously done the things to other people they did. You think of Miss... Sort of glue shoes the contortionist sitting there trying to explain how she managed to erase all that tape and you remember back at the uh, haranguing that you had to en endure from people when you said that this administration was not honest but I, I wonder a bit the question yes. of <laughs> the question of the balance but not necessarily aimlessly <laughs> I, I was going to say something at the beginning of the program and we've gone on a, a, an important question which is the balance between the branches of government but if I could take one second, I'd like to say that, curiously, out of our long history of basic disagreement on many questions, I find now, I think, from reading your writings extensively, that there is a greater overlap in what we feel the country needs to do than probably there's ever been before. And I've tried to figure out why that is. Is it that our disagreements are less, and I think not? Is it that our sense of America uh, has come to be the same, and I think maybe that's part of it. I think that there is a now an opportunity to agree on priorities for this country that <clears throat> transcend ideological differences, although those remain, and at some point in the future will have to be battled over again. But the first thing I think we share is the feeling that integrity is the basis of democracy, that you can't have consent of the governed if they don't know what they're consenting to, <laughs> and that any administration that misleads the people and this uses its powers. I, I admired your column on the enemies list, especially because possibly because I'm 007 on the list, and so as a beneficiary of the attentions of federal agencies that were improperly visited on me, I found it very important that, in your words, that this was the most hideous, I believe you called it, document, the most proto-fascist document to come out of an American administration in a long time. But Lowenstein, for all the natural pleasure he took from partisanship, did not conceal his concern for symbols by which his own confederates were being misguided. I favored recognizing China for a long time when you didn't, but I never favored what we call detente now, uh, what Nixon calls detente now, uh, when it turns out detente consists, for instance, of subsidizing the Soviet Union or of abandoning policies we ought to follow in 
uh, India and Pakistan in order to appease the Chinese communists. I think that detente has become supineness in the face of uh, political needs of the president at home rather than uh, a reality of what our posture vis-a-vis -vis the communist power should be in the world. And out of all these senses of uh, abandoning the purpose of government in favor of the political power of a few individuals, I've come to feel that we need to have a kind of coalition for the next three years <coughs> that would get people committed to democratic process and to integrity in the government uh, together to work out how to solve the immediate crunch that uh, the events of the past uh, year have, have made clear we're in. In 1975, Albert Lowenstein championed yet another cause, the search for the true killer of Robert Kennedy. He professed himself reluctant to take it on, knowing it would bring pain to the Kennedy family. But he was convinced that someone other than Sihan Sihan had fired the fatal bullet. He went so far as to question the conduct of the press. The investigation finally brought on official action in Los Angeles, which, however, tended to confirm the original version of events. But at the beginning of the program, I, I had great problems uh, dealing with this because uh, Robert Kennedy was, to me, like to millions of people, uh, I think the most promising and perhaps beloved person of our, of our time. And uh, the Kennedy family uh, has been through more than any family. And we didn't, I didn't want to raise these questions publicly because I knew it would, would more, be more pain for them. And many of the people closest uh, to this history uh, have not been willing to be involved because of that important consideration. And so none of us, I think, without minimizing the value of those who were smarter than we were and raised these questions persistently during the years that we didn't, uh, n none of us are having any recriminations about the way the case was handled. Nobody is trying to blame anybody. Nobody that I know of wants to simply get into a sort of cockfight over the uh, dogmas that one hears at every point. All that we're saying is, look, here are the facts. The bullets, there are too many. If, explain that in some way. The, the, the leading forensic pathologists don't think that the ones that have been fired and, and tested match. Let's get that studied and find out. Let's make the scientific effort with the gun, with the panels, with the clothing that can be done. And at the end of that, if we find, as you suggested we might, that it's inconclusive, we've done at least what we need to do to find out that it's inconclusive. Yeah. But if it isn't inconclusive, wouldn't it be horrendous to go into another presidential election without knowing whether a group of conspirators may exist in this country who, at moments of political decision, influence the course of events improperly. I, the, the question of the media, which we haven't gotten into, is even more baffling. Uh, it's, a, it's worth at least mentioning, I suppose, that the Los Angeles Times to this day, although it's run a lead editorial ridiculing what we've been doing and an editorial cartoon and run Mr. Bush's replies, which misquoted me, they've never run what I've said. They've never run what Mr. Schrader and I said at our press conference or in our reply to Mr. Bush. Uh, and that's the paper of general circulation in Los Angeles. So people in Los Angeles haven't known the seriousness and the quality of the difficulties that we've talked about. Have you ever written a letter to the publisher of the Los Angeles Times and asked him why? I haven't. I phoned, and I perhaps should put in writing these questions. I, I think that if I can make a coalition with you for a moment, that the conduct not just of the Los Angeles Times but of the Washington Post has been very odd in this situation because the Washington Post is, I suppose, the most respected paper uh, in investigative areas because of its uh, history in Watergate. And yet, they ran an article which was utterly and totally inaccurate, saying that Mr. Harper himself had repudiated his findings on the ballistics. Uh, Ronnie Kessler's article. Yes. Mr. Harper, the opening paragraph of that was that the, the nationally known ballistics expert who first raised the question about the bullets coming from Sarah now says there's no evidence to support these questions. Now, Mr. Harper not only never said that, because it runs counter to his whole effort for the last years, but wrote the Washington Post twice telling them that he hadn't said it, and they won't print those letters. And I find I have enormous regard for the purpose of the Washington Post, and I'm baffled. Now you know how we Republicans feel when we write the Washington Post. <laughs> in 1976, Al Lowenstein was running yet again for a seat in Congress. He had made some enemies and some friends by disputing the position taken by the American Civil Liberties Union on the question of aid to church-related schools. He is explaining here his position to me and to Leo Pfeffer, the principal swordsman on this issue of the ACLU. In the first place, let me say that I think that the yeshivas maintained for Jewish students are an important contribution to the Jewish community, and I think that they are in the same kind of financial difficulty as other private parochial schools. So I would want to be very sure that this doesn't get the cast of a Jewish versus 
um, Catholic or versus somebody else, which it is not in my view. So I, I think it's first of all important to say that part of the reason that I favor um, a rational program not of subsidizing uh, churches by federal or other uh, public monies, but of protecting the right of parents to decide where their children sh should get educated is that I think a great many Jewish parents, as well as Catholic and, and Protestant parents, want to exercise that right and that I believe that right is helpful to the whole dynamic of America and I don't want to see it polarized on, on what I think is spurious grounds. But beyond that, there is a much yeah, You're more, saying what we're Let me just say what I want to... I want to you don't think Catholic think all Jews, I, I all Jews agree with me. No, I know. Uh, you know, the Orthodox clearly, are very st uh, uh, strongly right. opposed well, to my I'm position. I'm not Orthodox, but we, we yes, are 50-50 here, so I perhaps we can that. illustrate the sure, tendency of the sure, Jewish sure. community not to agree unanimously Surely, on things that they shouldn't. I'm very Orthodox, by the way. <laughs> but I, wa I want to, uh, if I may, raise the, the larger question again, which seems to me slips past us all the time, that in, in straining at this gnat of whether a, a, an infinitely small amount of money, which is what we're talking about, we're talking about uh, a total projected for all parents uh, of tax exemptions and credits that would amount to two billion dollars if we accepted the present proposal in the big Senate. Nat. It's a very small net because the Archdiocese in New York has three billion dollars worth of tax exempt property to say nothing of the Jewish, Protestant, and other religious groups in this city. So we're talking about a tiny net. The total cost of public education in this country in a year uh, two billion dollars is what? Less than one percent of that. So we're talking about a very tiny gnat that we're straining and struggling to f and out of that tiny gnat most of that doesn't go to the parents of children going to parochial schools because most of that will go to the parents helping to, uh, to have their children go to public institutions of higher education. So uh, to be in perspective let's understand that a tiny gnat here we're, we're, we're raising all sorts of notions that this is in some way allowing churches to teach that the Jews are responsible for the death of Christ and whatnot, whereas at the same time, we're allowing vast subsidies to go on the grounds that the court has said it's all right, much faster subsidies to go to the institutions that you're afraid will in some place, which I don't believe exists, have teachers say things which are offensive to some uh, other communities. I, I believe that if you would back off from the sort of uh, specificities of legal argument in this situation, and look at the, at the fabric of the society that you could agree that in America, the most important thing we can do right now is to find a fair way of dealing with all of our children. Education is the backbone of the country. Education generally is suffering, in my view, in the country. And I think if we could work together to make sure that every parent had an opportunity to decide how their children should be educated, that that would encourage support from all communities for a much more substantial assistance to the process of education, which would help the country enormously. In January 1977, Alan Lowenstein was made the American delegate to the Human Rights Commission of the United Nations, which meets every year in Geneva. For the first time in the 25-year history of that commission, there was Alan Lowenstein actually entering a criticism of human rights in the Soviet Union, referring to the persecution of the dissidents. But at the same time, he was cautious in his dealings with third world countries raising problems of definition transacted at a firing line session in London where he was vigorously interrogated by several young British critics. I think the embarrassment about all this is that in a funny sort of way what you're doing is an evang evangelist mission for the Western style of life. And when you do that, and I believe it's a form of imperialism which I fanatically believe to be right and just, you come up with the embarrassing difficulty of a place like Uganda which most civilized men would have little difficulty in describing as one of the squalid, pettier tyrannies of the world. But when you come to actually ask African and Asian governments to do something about this, they are so utterly pusillanimous, utterly cowardly, or utterly self-interested, that the whole thing becomes an appalling charade. I'd be very interested in your comments as to how African and Asian governments have reacted to the question of Uganda. You see, I think that is the sort of evangelistic crusade, the imperialist yeah. culture that reflects itself in your conclusion. Because what we're trying to say is the precise reverse of what you're saying. Namely, we're not condoning pusillanimity about Uganda or mm. indifference to Uganda. And when we raised the issue of Uganda, and the UK was, a, was very strong on Uganda, as was Canada, mm. we weren't preaching at the Africans that they shouldn't that they should accept our view of Uganda. We were saying that this is a view which should be universal about Uganda. Now, Oh, that's double talk with No, it's not double talk. What's double talk is not to perceive that the West has been guilty in its own way 
of its own blindnesses. Oh, yes, that's and certainly that's true. All we're saying, therefore, is that instead of denunciation of Africa as unwilling to deal with this question... You mean of all of Africa? Of all of Africa. Oh, yes. What you do is you say, look, the African Council of Churches has become involved in this. Mm -hmm. There are in Africa at least a couple of presidents of countries who stand head and shoulders above most leaders of co governments mm -hmm. throughout the world in their in their morality, their conviction that there's got to be a, a sort of non-racial solution to problems. Milton Nabote, for instance. Well, certainly so, Kenneth Coenda. So yeah. you think that you ought to be able to pat them on the head and say, well, we in the civilized West, we don't like cannibalism, and of course, in another couple of hundred years, you'll grow out of it. We think you might, the sooner you grow out of it, the better, but we'll do nothing to push you into growing out of being a cannibal. Mrs. Not Evans is a barrister and a member of the City Council of London. Go ahead. It's amazing how the ocean conflicts, how, make, how language does not transmit itself across the ocean from that, those two interpretations of my remarks. I don't want to pat anyone on the head, and Why I don't not? want Why them not? patting Why me not? on the head. Why not? Why not? No, what I want to do, pat on the head has the notion of condescension. What I want to do is the precise reverse. I want to take countries which have different histories, different values, different religions, different crises to deal with, and understand where they're coming from while we try to make them understand where we're coming from, to I find a synthesis it. of that. And that seems to me not to be anyone condescending to anyone, but does, everyone... Does this argue for greater toleration of South Africa? Well, it argues for an understanding of South Africa, not a toleration, which is different. I want to see people in South Africa, Albert Latuli, uh, Helen Suzman. I'd like to see an atmosphere develop where black and white can survive together in South Africa, but my experience in South Africa is very clear that the problem there is obviously not going to be resolved until the white population stops trying to run the country on a basis where it is the master race. Therefore, on South Africa, and I think this is a critical part of what we're saying, <coughs> because of the racial ingredient in South Africa, it is perfectly natural for Africans, and I hope for Europeans, to feel a greater resentment that people, because of their color or race, are kept in servitude or in degradation, whatever you describe South Africa as being. <coughs> Whereas, in other places, the reason for that oppression is not race. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm less concerned about oppression for whatever reason. But wait, listen for one second. Because we've got to understand each other on this. It's crucial to understand why it's not double standard for us to be concerned about the murders in Uganda and concerned about the oppression in South Africa. The 18 people who died in prison mysteriously are dead. And that is something which the South African government has to answer for. And what we're saying about all this is that if we're even-handed, a dead South African black is as important as a dead Ugandan and vice versa. But that we understand that people coming from centuries of white rule are going to be more sensitive to white oppression than they are to black oppression because of that history. That doesn't mean that they should be, but it means they are and we understand it. Let me, let me give you one example of this. The existential point. point yeah. Yes, that you... So I'm, go ahead, I'm talking too much. Well, well, no, go ahead, finish your point. Go well, what, I, what I'm suggesting is so crucial is to accept the fact that <clears throat> where we tolerated for a long time oppressive governments that were white in southern Africa, and we, in fact, supported them for a long time. We supported the Portuguese in their wars in, in Mozambique and Angola. We supported these governments because our perception of our interest was, in fact, different than the perception of a lot of Africans about what they wanted. Now, when you end that kind of history, you want to get to a new phase where our sincerity in saying we don't want to have any colonial rule. Oh, come on, is it sincerity? Isn't it just white liberal guilt complex? I don't feel... Well, let me ask you, see, you, one, we, no, me ask you one thing. You see, you what that is is white liberal guilt oh, complex. Oh, wait. You've you just appear, illustrated you appear, you appear why is it white believing. liberal... Let me ask you a question. You've had You appear to believe intensely on what you're paid to do. Fair enough. But let me ask you this. Would you be in a more powerful position to put your views into action if you were, say, a senator, a congressman, than sitting in a uh, window dressing club because in Western Europe, that's basically what it's... I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's politicians on the way down or, or it's a nice place for the radical chic to spend a couple of years. But the states in the 1950s and the civil rights movement, wouldn't you have had more influence being a, a liberal, um, radical congressman then uh, than being the equivalent in, in the, the Human Rights Commission at that well, time? Exactly who's going, what internal countries don't care? Who's going to listen? Aren't you going to do more... You've more asked about four questions. Let's all take right, them well, on. It, take it, first time. of all, it, is, it is certainly is not as if I hadn't tried to be a congressman. I think you would have that. <laughs> well, I, that's... Nor, may I say, is it as if I didn't involve myself in the kinds of causes well, you said. I, well, that's, why I, I went, that's why I asked you When I went that. to Southwest Africa a long time ago, mm -hmm. uh, I went despite the fact that the United States policy was very different, and I went there because I felt that citizens had an obligation to try to do what they could <clears throat> against injustice in any place where they could be useful. So I would agree with you that if one simply goes to be chic at some convention, that it's not very useful. 
but most of my life I haven't been paid no, by I anybody. I, I wasn't so necessarily being personal. I was just well, asking it, as a, as a it generality. It sound a bit personal. Well, Wouldn't you be more useful to... In well, any case, let me say you're, this. You're that, a representative yeah. in a situation, so you well, can't complain. But perhaps but therefore it, you get personal perhaps it questions. says something about the country that it's selected to represent. It's somebody whose history is, in fact, what mine was, which was to take positions against policies of my government when I thought they were wrong on these questions. That may say something about what the United States is trying to do, and I think that part of it should be evaluated as an indication of something other than radical chic. I think it's something very clear. It's not guilt. It's commitment. But I wanted to say before, and we got sort of off the subject, because my record is certainly a minor part of this whole question. What is major is what I was trying to say about Uganda, South Africa, and Portugal, and all of that, yeah. which is a very intricate yeah. interconnection. Sure. I made this comment at the uh, Human Rights Commission. I said, during the discussion on self-determination, I said, you know, we're, we have this sort of drill we go through every year of denouncing colonialism and imperialism and all of that. And I said, one thing we ought to congratulate ourselves about and have a right to say is a good mm -hmm. sign of progress is that if you look at the map, it's a different color now. There isn't this great set of empires which uh, used to dominate the, 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 uh, the map of the world. And a lot of that came out of the impetus of the developing countries and out of the United Nations emphasis on decolonialization. But I said it's also true that self-determination has to mean more than not having a foreign army occupy your country. It has to mean also that people can choose their own form of government. And if you are denied that right in your own country by your own armed forces, You're not really you don't have self-determination. <laughs> now that discussion, you see, it seems to me, doesn't mean that we're trying to tell countries what form of government they should select, but that we have an obligation to be concerned that in the ways that are limited not to intervention militarily, not to f economic pressures that are designed to crush other points of view, but through what John Quincy Adams once described as our concern for the rights of people to be free everywhere through prayers and benedictions, I believe he said, that we have the right to be concerned that people have a chance to select their own form of government. Now, in that context, let's understand something very clear. It is perfectly true if you don't have food, you're not terribly concerned about the form of your government. It is perfectly true that if we don't understand that part of the concept of human rights, we are going to be culturally abandoned because we're going to have such a predilection to our own sense of values that other people will be mystified. But I'm saying something which I hope you'll see is consistent with being concerned about other people's view of what they want, which is that when other people are concerned about what they want, we ought to be sympathetic to it. And if they're denied the right to express that, even by their own colonels or their own whatever, that our support for that government would be imperialism because we would be inflicting that government on the <laughs> The next time Allard appeared on Firing Line was as a member of a panel charged with interrogating me about a number of public positions I had taken and others being discussed. Lowenstein, having just resigned from the United Nations, where he had served as an ambassador under Chief Delegate Andrew Young, was running for the last time, it proved, and again unsuccessfully, for a seat in Congress. One of his opponents, Carter Burden was also a panelist, as also Mrs. Harriet Pilpel, lawyer, writer, lecturer. At first, the question came up of the Equal Rights Amendment. The question I want to ask, though, is why are you uh, so hostile to ERA when all it really says, as far as I think, as a lawyer and as someone who voted for it in the Congress, what it says <coughs> is that there shall not be discrimination against people on the basis of sex, except where that is justified <laughs> because of something that, in fact, is defined uh, by the sex itself. In other words, I don't think that the law <coughs> ought to discriminate on the basis of sex, because if you do that, what you're doing is you're inflicting discriminatory patterns, whereas there are things where men and women are clearly and should remain clearly different, and that would not be obliterated by an amendment of the Constitution that simply stated that these discriminations could not occur simply because of sex <coughs> rather than because of other factors which might be reflected in the sex of the person. Well, if, 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 if what you're saying is that under ERA you would still have separate restrooms, the answer is that's true. Yeah, yeah. It is not, however, true, and Professor Paul Freund of the Harvard Law School uh, has stressed this point, uh, just where the division uh, asserts itself, for instance, can women, can you draft a man but not a woman uh, to serve in the war? Uh, under uh, ERA, this is by no means explicated. Uh, so so le 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 let us agree to begin with that there would be huge arguments between one set of people and another set of people as to what ERA means in a particular situation. Uh, but I, I, I dispute that. Just on, on, as there has been on every Th That's amendment. right. On every, <laughs> every part of the Constitution. Yeah. It would be no more, no less uh, than the problem we have on all parts uh, of the well, Constitution. Uh, well, uh, the, 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 I expand on that by saying 
when, when, we freed, uh, uh, when we freed the black man, when we gave votes uh, to, to uh, women, we were saying fairly straightforward things, which in due course required amplification. But there is, in my judgment, no necessity uh, to liberate women through constitutional means when uh, simple statutes uh, have never proved uh, uh, inadequate to the task. Well, let's, that, let's not give to the Constitution a task to do which can be done by individual Congresses is, I think, a fairly safe presumption for me anyway. However, but let me answer this question because uh, uh, I, we can get into the sort of Phyllis Schlafly level argument about ERA, and I think some of her arguments are very compelling. I see my, my principal objection to ERA is that I think it's, uh, uh, I think it is metaphysically uh, presumptuous it seems to be urging a kind of uh, indifferentiation um, between the sexes, which I don't think uh, faithfully reflects uh, uh, reality or even, uh, 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 even uh, the ideal by, by seeking a, a procrastinization of the sexes uh, through constitutional means. Uh, I think it is reaching out to say things that I feel very uneasy about seeing said in the Constitution. My, my sense of it is, I think, the opposite, which is that without ERA, we have courtesy of HEW frequently and under Republican presidents with Alabama Republican secretaries, we've had the most absurd guidelines issued in the name of ending discrimination. And those guidelines, including prohibition on choirs being determined by the sex of the participants, all those things. You'd have the guidelines anyway. But my point is that's happened without ERA, and to blame ERA for an effort to procrastinize sexes, it seems to me, is backwards. What I think ERA does, and why I think it's important to attempt to get it enacted, is that it would settle once and for all the fact that you cannot discriminate unfairly on the basis of sex, for instance, an amount of money paid for similar work uh, rendered. But it would not then do what we're now doing, which is to fish around through administrative guidelines for a lot of spurious efforts to impose equality, where in fact what we're imposing is an absurd mm. uh, homogenization. You, you would need guidelines anyway. The, the point is, uh, uh, where are they going to come from? Are they going to come from administrative agencies, or are they going to come from the courts? Right. On the whole, administrative agencies are easier to correct than court findings, and much less expensive to do so. I would like to point out that many lawyers have been of the opinion for <coughs> a long time that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, which says that no state shall deny equal protection by inference, no, Congress, Congress shall not deny equal protection, is precisely the same as the Equal Rights Amendment. The problem is that what you deplore hasn't happened here. The court has not judicially legislated to extend equal protection so that race, <coughs> so that although race is a suspect category now under the Equal Protection Clause, sex has not been held to be. All that the Equal Protection Clause would do, the Equal Rights Amendment would do, would be to say, hereafter, you cannot discriminate against either a male or a female because he is a male or a female. That does not in any way interfere with any kind of differentiation you want to draw between people because of their very well, incapacities to do things. I don't even want to be told that. I'm a, I'm a free man, and uh, uh, it seems to me that um, the burden of society is to tolerate other people's crotchets. Uh, if if uh, if I thought that there was, uh, the, if if I thought that there was class oppression uh, in this country uh, against um, uh, women, I would seek remedy by set legislation. I don't see that. But if I want, for instance, to advertise for a for a female nurse to look after my uh, mother. Uh, I would like to be able to do so without feeling that the sheriff is going to come to my door and say I had just violated a constitutional amendment by making that distinction. Uh, I, don't, I don't see why you people are so hot and bothered about it. Let, let, let me hire a woman when I want, a man when I want. Uh, well, I'm so hot and bothered about it because I'm a woman and it's women who have suffered from unequal treatment according to the kind of things Mr. Lowenstein said, not equal pay for equal work discriminatory legislation in terms of what they may do and may not do, which has nothing to do with is, their abilities. I don't abilities. think it is the documented fact that women have, uh, have suffered uh, all that grievously. Of course, you were without a vote for a while, and there's the, you, you certainly you, you, you suffered a political oh. disability of a very explicit nature there. But uh, 
I might remind you that ever since we got hot and bothered about women's uh, rights, the number of women entering the professions has actually declined. The only thing I want to add, I don't want to take so much on this subject that we get grounded into it, but I, my concern about it is perhaps not the same as yours, because I think that it is an important amendment to pass for men. I don't see it as a female feminist issue. I think the society now is laden with unfairnesses to both sexes inappropriately. <clears throat> I know that's the case in many marital situations, for instance, and I think that it would be fair to say that one of the virtues of this amendment would be that it would require equity at law on the basis of a society which does not want to inflict homogenization but does not want to see improper discrimination based on an irrelevant consideration as sex is but in the some trouble situations. Is, you see, the trouble is for you to decide that uh, an entity other than the individual America is going to decide what is relevant seems to me to constrict, not to broaden freedom. On we went to the question of capital punishment. The usual objection was raised that those punished are generally poor and incapable of getting sufficient legal aid. Uh, the, 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 the notion, the, no, the, the arguments for capital punishment are not discredited by the fact that capital punishment is impartially uh, administered any more than the arguments for law uh, are discredited by the fact that uh, only fairly wealthy people can hire lawyers in many instances. I've never understood the notion, I still do not understand the notion, that people who can understand the validity of taking up arms against Hitler or other times involving themselves in what results in the loss of human life uh, suddenly become what amounts to pacifists on the question of capital punishment. I think it's absurd to say one's for capital punishment as if there's something virtuous about killing somebody or whoever it is. But that we were engaged in a great moral struggle to protect uh, some high principle when the man in Utah <coughs> wanted to end his life as part of his understanding of what he had done, that seemed to me to be one of the most extraordinary uh, extensions of moral hypocrisy and Fault fervor it. for no purpose, whatever. But most people who it. are condemned to capital punishment do not feel the way the man in Utah felt, and no, they no, do not want not. capital no. punishment imposed upon yeah, them. That, no, no, but that isn't yeah, the point. Most people who are murdered will just not be murdered. Right. Well, but can I, let me saying. just sort of finish on this point, which is not to say that I am minimizing the complexity of the sociological unfairnesses to poorer people in our society or to people of minority races, which are very, very important social causes that we should all uh, be aware of and work on. But I do think that to use that as a grounds to say that there are not circumstances under which capital punishment is of a lot of unacceptable and un unattractive options of the one that is necessarily to be taken. I just don't see that. I don't see it as a great deterrent, but I do see anyone that says to me that Eichmann should not have been put to death has to explain to me why not. And I do not understand how you can say you're against capital punishment uh, as, a, as an absolute unless you're prepared to take that position. So my view of it is it's a spurious issue. It becomes emotionally very supercharged where people take sides and polarize, whereas most people of intelligence would agree that capital punishment's a terrible thing, that the sociological situation producing a disproportional number of poor and minority people suffering extreme punishment, whether it's death or incarceration or whatever, that that's a, a goal that we ought to work to change, but that finally there has to be some uh, recourse to capital punishment under certain circumstances, and that we ought to then get over this polarized argument and move to the great questions that that drowns out. Well, I, I think that what you've said all falls to pieces, frankly, although I should leave it up to Bill to say this. I'm afraid he won't. Uh, by reason of the fact that there is absolutely no evidence or data to indicate that capital punishment is a deterrent no, to murder. Advocate, and most murders... I'm not advocating it. Uh, well, I, let's just say that I... If you will read the last books of Professor James Q. Wilson and Ernest Vandenhag, they will give you the sources. Well, but mm -hmm. the, the, they, to some extent, those authors assume their conclusions. And there is a great deal of data to the opposite effect. They discredited. I don't think that the argument of capital punishment rises or falls to the deterrent question unless you can explain to me why it was in the interests of humanitarian concerns to allow the people who murdered the Israeli athletes at Munich to not be put to death for that crime. I do not begin to understand that reasoning. Deterrent or no deterrent, I find it very difficult to understand that approach. We ended the hour by questioning the usefulness of the United Nations as an agent of idealistic diplomatic behavior. Lowenstein confessed his misgivings, but stressed, as ever, the need for reforms. I want to go back to the Sharansky, Moynihan, Andrew Young foreign policy range of problems, which you talk about a great deal, and where uh, we started and then got off onto other important questions. I am uh, concerned, for instance, about how 
you would deal with the importance of individual initiatives on the part of diplomats to express their concerns as you supported Moynihan when he did it at the United Nations and as you wrote <coughs> in your book that you've been able to do it more and how you would distinguish <coughs> those concerns from some of the ones that you've expressed lately uh, where the statements made have been statements that you did not agree with. I, I, I see the Sharansky case is bringing it into focus because as you know I was very active for Sharansky while I was an American uh, official and sometimes uh, said things that went beyond what was being said by higher officials because of the concern that I felt about that case and about other dissidents in the Soviet Union. Was I, in your view, acting improperly in expressing those views while I was a, a person in the government service? And if not, how do you then talk about the present situation that's agitated so many people involving Andrew Young? Uh, the, the, the treaty, uh, the United Nations Treaty specifies in, very, in crystal clear language that delegates to the United Nations shall take positions that represent the views of the President of the United States uh, whose, um, and this is actually mentioned in the law, whose Secretary of State shall routinely communicate those instructions. Now therefore when Andrew Young says something uh, as harrowing as his recent imputation that the massacre of the missionaries was a uh, plot by Ian Smith, or that the United States is hardly to be distinguished from the Soviet Union in respect of political prisoners, it is extremely embarrassing to the President of the United States and violates the law. If you say to me, what kind of a reform ought we to have that permits the kind of license you exercised and Moynihan uh, exercised, which, by the way, I like to think did not embarrass the President, since you didn't make preposterous statements, you made very sound statements, uh, is one that would detach those emissaries in the United Nations from the formal diplomatic establishment <coughs> and give them sort of a judge-like tenure. What we want in our human rights commissions are Roger Baldwins, uh, not people who are, are not permitted to raise the subject of Cambodia uh, because we're seeking detente with China. Uh, to mix human rights up with diplomacy is difficult enough as it is. To do so when there is a chain of authority that requires you to be dumb uh, in, by, when, you, in, 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 when you are <coughs> technically engaged in trying to promote human rights is, I think, travesty. Well, I was, sorry. No, go ahead. Sorry. I was uh, fishing over the past year and a half for a formulation that would, that would satisfy both my feeling that your book states brilliantly what the problem is uh, about having people sent there who are not supposed to be robots but are supposed to bring their own credentials and qualities. And then the dilemma we're put into when statements are made by <coughs> ambassadors, which in fact are statements which do not represent policy or which con contradict uh, what we would uh, feel would be the most useful thing to do. How that line is drawn seems to me to carry implications far beyond the immediate situation in the United Nations. I agree. <coughs> I agree. The last program viewed in January of this year reflected on the principal events of 1979 and commanding everyone's attention then as now was the matter of the hostages, who at the time the program was taped had been in captivity for over a month. I think what he said, what Arthur Schlesinger's piece said, is that if there were public discussion on the questions raised by the seizure of the hostages, it would be clear that there is unanimity among Americans on the question that we will not yield to blackmail, and that therefore a public discussion would not be counter to the unity that we have to display but that the fact that there is criticism of discussion suggests that there is a sort of enforced unanimity where it doesn't exist. And uh, I think actually if we looked at it from the perspective of a distant uh, patience, we've been a month of prayer and people who haven't prayed in a long time I think have done that because of their concern for the human beings involved in this terrible situation. Uh, we've shown a greater unanimity of feeling than we have in a long time as a people. Uh, Governor Reagan, on the other hand, in the course of that, and I think without doing any violence to that unanimity of feeling, has suggested the Shah should be our guest here in perpetuity, as it were. Uh, Andrew Young, who was late our ambassador at the UN and presumably still close to President Carter, uh, has spoken of the Shah in very, very hostile terms. I think he called him a torturer and a murderer and said that Khomeini was a brilliant man that was comment from him on these questions. My sense of it is, is that it is better to accept the fact that people are going to discuss questions about this 
in the course of which, no matter how they may differ on subsidiary questions, they agree entirely on the fact that there cannot be any yielding to the blackmail, there cannot be any discussion of terms regarding anything else until those hostages are out. And that what I think Arthur Schlesinger was saying is that the sense that, say, Kennedy did something inpro inappropriate in discussing this when others have already been discussing it is a, is a misperception of what he did and of what the country should do. And I would like to say, and I think for all of us here, that there is no deviation that I know of on the part of anybody in this country that uh, would suggest lack of unity on the central question that you're concerned about. But there may be, and probably ought to be, a discussion on questions that do not distort our perception of other issues raised by foreign policy questions. And I'm sure that Ronald Reagan would agree that his statement was appropriate uh, in trying to get people to focus not on where we would uh, divide later, but on what things have led up to this and how we can behave to show that democracy uh, is strong enough to encounter this kind of uh, atrocious misconduct on the part of other people without giving up our basic intelligence and our basic right to discuss our policies. Well, and then a final comment in which he meditated on the public dialogue, the course of the presidential elections, and as he put it, the nature of the civilization we're trying to build. The question I really wanted to get to, if I can just take a second, is that we, we've sort of tottered on toward the question of politicians saying very little as they run, no matter who they are. And I think that's an indictment that applies to most politicians in, in most campaigns. And it is compounded by the fact that everybody now spends 90% of their money on television where it's very difficult to say anything in 30 seconds or one minute that means anything. I think that's true of every candidate for president right now, and I think it's sad. And I would agree with you that if we could discuss why, as, as politics descends into that level of non-discussion, why that's a terrible problem in a society faced with great crises. 52% of the people in this country now receive assistance from the government compared to 48%. I mean, how is that going to continue? What are we going to do about energy? Why don't we put a dollar tax on gas so we can begin to conserve instead of waste? I mean, all these topics about which I think we ought to be talking in this campaign are not being discussed by any candidates. And if we discuss the year 1979, or prospectively the next campaign, without dealing with those questions, instead of the sort of simplistic slogans about who's left or who's right, I think we've done a disservice to the public I couldn't dialogue. agree with you more, but um, are you saying that nobody who's running for president has taken positions on any of these Well, subjects? I say that most of them in the end sound like a blur, that it's part of the process that we seem to have arrived at of everything getting homogenized into, mm -hmm. I mean, the press will say Reagan's moving to the center, Kennedy's moving to the center, everybody's moving here and there. But what really does happen, it seems to me, is that there is not just for president, but for Congress, for every position, there is an increased dis disinclination to have discourse on subjects. And it would be much more important on a program like this, which is one of the few genuinely useful programs I think that exist, because it brings people together to discuss ideas, to talk about the question of what do we do about the inflation and energy questions in a presidential year. How do we get a country which is capable of such magnificent conduct out of the terrible slot that's led us to the position we are now, where everybody is more parochial, more self-seeking, not just politicians, but the public and all the communities that co constitute that uh, mosaic. What is it we do to try to raise that in this year so that we discuss not only individuals for president, but the nature of the civilization we're trying to build? I had seen Alad Lowenstein for the last time. Eight weeks later, I was asked to participate at his funeral. Possibly as a dissenter, my own experience with him was unique in that we conservatives did not generally endorse his political prescriptions so that we were presumptively opponents of Al Lowenstein in those straightened chambers in which we spend and misspend so much of our lives. It was his genius that so many of those he touched, generally arriving a half hour late, discovered intuitively the underlying communion. He was in our time the original activist. Such was his impatience with the sluggishness of justice so that his rhythms were more often than not disharmonious with those that govern the practical Bonosic councils of this world. His habits were appropriately disarrayed. He was late to breakfast, to his appointments, Late in announcing his sequential availability for public service, he was punctual only in registering, though often underage, 
for service in any army that conceived itself bound in righteousness. How did he live such a life, so hectic with public concern, while preoccupying himself so fully with the individual human being whose torments, never mind their singularity, he adopted as his own with the passion that some give only to the universal. Eleanor Roosevelt, James Burnham once mused, looked on all the world as her personal slum project. Although at home with collectivist formulations, one had the impression of Alad Lowenstein that he might be late in aborting a third world war because of his absorption with the problems of one sophomore. Oh, they followed him everywhere because we experienced in him the essence of an entirely personal dedication of all the partisans I had known from the furthest steps of the spectrum. He's, his was the most undistracted concern, not for humanity, though he was conversant with big think formulations, but with human beings. Those of us who dealt with him often in those narrow passages constrained by time clocks and fire laws and deadlines, think back ruefully on the happy blend of purpose and carelessness with which he arranged his own career and his own schedule. A poet might be tempted to say, if only the Lord had granted us that Alad should also have arrived late at his own assassination. But all his life, he was felled by mysteries, dominant among them those most readily understood by more worldly men, namely that his rhythms were not of this world. His days foreshortened lived out the secular dissonances. Behold, thou hast made my days as it were a span long, and mine age is even as nothing in respect of thee and verily every man living is altogether vanity. The psalmist spoke to Al on Friday last. I became dumb and opened not my mouth, for it was thy doing. To those of us not yet dumb, the psalmist also spoke, saying the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and those who are crushed in spirit he saves. Who was the wit who said that nature abhors a vacuum? Let nature then fill this vacuum. That is the challenge which breathed the friends of Alan Lowenstein hurl up to nature and to nature's God prayerfully, demandingly, because today, Lord, our loneliness is great. Printed bound transcript of this program, send $1 to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29250. Indicate the subject of the program and please allow three weeks for delivery. This program was produced by SICA, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding was provided by this station and by other public television stations. Thank mm -hmm. you.